Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us on Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, taking some time out of your busy weekend. So um, I'm David Yost with Maryfield Garden Center, and Debbie is not with us today. She's enjoying some time at the beach, so I'm filling in for Debbie. And we've got a terrific person here today with us, one of our talented landscape designers, Renata Holt. Nice to see you, Dave. Thanks for being here. Great. And you've got a, an interesting program planned for us today. I do. I'm really excited about the show today. Today we're going to get a little combination of history, science, and horticulture all rolled into one show. Absolutely. And I would have called you a guest, but really you're not a guest. You've been here no. often enough. You're, you're kind of a regular here. And, and you always do bring something a little different slant with you, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Well, yes, I've been on the show before, and today what we're going to do is talk about fragrance gardens, but we're going to take a little twist on it. Um, it's, uh, you know, we all know about some of the wonderful plants that smell good in our gardens, but today we're going to talk a little bit about the history of fragrance, why it's important to us, and uh, why fragrance is important to the plants as well. Great. Well, before we jump into that, I do have a couple announcements to make. Okay. Um, one is we are doing our ticket giveaways, and we, we do this throughout the year, but I kind of want to make a special announcement because we have some special tickets that are available. Uh, if you can get down to the garden center today before closing time, uh, you just go down there, you put your name in the basket, no purchases are necessary. Uh, this is just something we do to let our customers know how much we appreciate you. Uh, but we're giving away tickets to uh, the Beyonce concert, which is coming up on uh, Monday, the 29th. She's also doing a show Tuesday on the 30th. And then also we have tickets to go hear Justin Bieber, um, who is coming up on the August 3rd. But if you put your name in the box down there, like I said, there's no purchase necessary. You do stand a good chance of winning one of those tickets to the Beyonce or Justin Bieber concert. And then we also do give away tickets to sporting events. So uh, we have tickets for the Nationals baseball games as well. So that's a terrific thing to do. And of course, we are continuing with our tent sale at all three locations, and that's always fun because uh, you can go out there and find bargains. And as we go through and sort of clean out the nooks and crannies and all our storage areas, we find things that might be overstock or out of season or maybe a little bit of a scratch and dent thing. And we're constantly replenishing that. And you find all these little terrific bargains. And everybody, even I, enjoy a bargain. Yes, I know. Well, there's a lot of good stuff in there. And also, I want to add, while you're at Maryfield, putting your name in for the tickets and shopping the tent sale, um, also don't forget to go out and look in our shrub section, our annuals and perennials. Even though it's July and it's hot, we are fully stocked. We're getting fresh shipments every day. You're not going to get any leftovers at Maryfield. We bring in new things for you all the time. So hopefully the show will inspire you to come in and, and add to your garden a little bit while you're there. Yeah, it's so true. I was helping customers the other day who were trying to find a replacement tree for dogwood that had died in their yard. And it happens we just this week had received some nice standard form crepe myrtles and other plants they were looking at. So it's just it's nice to be able to go out there and you really have all these beautiful plants to choose from. And the right. weather's great too. The weather is good. Suddenly we got a little break from that hot weather um, and so it's a nice time to be out working in the garden. That's right. Now we're talking about fragrance and I know some of my colleagues at the Garden Center are surprised that you wanted to begin by talking about boxwood. Yes. I want to talk about boxwood, which actually, when you think about it, um, boxwood has a very distinctive fragrance. And um, it's one of the plants that people will come into the garden center and either say, I really want a boxwood because I love the, the fragrance. And I have other people that come in and say to me as a designer, I don't want a boxwood anywhere on my property. So let me ask you, David, what's your thought on the smell of a boxwood? Do you like it or not? I'm kind of indifferent on this one. Uh, I, I'm not going to really say that I like it, but mm -hmm. it doesn't bother me. I'm always surprised at Christmas time when we're selling the greens, though, that people come in and they want that English boxwood with that fragrance That's to it. That's right. And um, it, for me, I'm, I, it's fine to me, although I have to say my husband actually loves fragrance. Um, and he asks me to put more boxwoods in all the time. But do you know why some people have such a different feel about boxwoods or anything that they smell. Uh, to me it's kind of musty smelling. It's not, not exactly what I'd call pleasant. Well, so. it all has to do with your olfactory bulb. I have one of those? You do. You have an olfactory bulb. Okay. Uh, we all do. All vertebrates have a, a, this, this thing called an olfactory bulb, which is the thing that helps us sort out scents. 
But the interesting thing is it's part of our brain. It's part of the limbic system. And the limbic system is responsible for emotion, motivation, response to certain things, and also long-term memory. So a lot of times when people smell something or they come in and they say, oh, I have to have a lilac because it reminds me of my grandmother. It's a scent that transports you back in time. Yeah, and that's true. Like so with the holidays and the greens, that's usually people are talking about reminds them of, you know, trips to their grandmother, their parents or something. Right. But I guess that also, like I said, with, um, I think of perfumes, and I know with women, they, they always use a perfume and I'll associate some of that fragrance well, that's, uh, with particular people. Well, that's a nice segue to our um, first slide. And uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about um, fragrance through the ages. In the first picture, David, can you read hieroglyphics? Uh, no, no, no. I, I'm old, but not that old. <laughs> Me too. Um, I can't read hieroglyphics either, but if I could, uh, this is an ancient cuneiform tablet from Mesopotamia uh, from about 1200 BC, and it's actually the first recorded history of perfume making. And if you could read that, you would see a chemist, and you would see the chemist's helpers, a still, and these helpers mixing oils and flowers together for the first fragrance. And actually, this is uh, the first perfume maker, and the perfume's maker name is Taputi, and actually, she's a woman. Oh, so well, I that thought, makes sense. I know, I think that's pretty fitting that the first perfume person was a woman. Um, and then we're gonna look at the next picture, which is of an ancient perfume factory in Cyprus. And this is really interesting to me that they believe that this was actually perfume manufactured on a commercial scale because this factory in this ruins uh, spans over 4,000 square meters. Yeah, so I think that's just interesting. It shows how what a priority they would put even through time on having a nice fragrance. That's right. So, you know, perfume making has been going on for a long time. And what we're going to do right now is talk about a few flowers that are uh, very traditional. The first one is a, is a lilac. And again, as I mentioned before, people come in, oh, I really want a lilac. And they are great. There's nothing more fragrant and wonderful than a lilac in bloom around Mother's Day. But frankly, David, the lilac plant, the traditional one, is really not the most attractive plant. Yeah, they do get big and rangy, so for our gardens, which are smaller, they can be a little bit of a challenge. They can be, and so now growers have developed some dwarf varieties of lilacs, which are great. There's three that we have at Maryfield, Miss Kim, Myers, and a new one that's um, reblooming called Bloomerang. Um, they're a nice, sturdy little shrub. They give you the same wonderful lilac fragrance, but without the ranginess of the plant. Yeah, well, like I said, of course, there's all kinds of flowers we can put in our garden. Right, and the next picture shows some carnations, again, an all-time favorite, excuse me, with a spicy fragrance. This ver variety is called Fire Witch, and uh, it blooms that bright pink flower, and boy, what a show it puts on. Um, the next picture, we're going to talk a little bit about lavender. Again, a favorite. Sometimes they can get too big, but we also have some dwarf varieties at Maryfield to choose from. And then the last picture in the set is uh, of a rose, which we love. But I would say, why don't you try some of the shrub roses, which have a wonderful, sweet, heady fragrance, but are a little easier to maintain. Great. Well, those are some excellent suggestions, of course, well-known plants that bring that fragrance in our garden and are the basis for a lot of the perfumes that are produced. That's right. Me. But uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break when we come back. We've got tons of other suggestions and ideas and plants that you can incorporate in your garden for wonderful fragrance. Flower power. Good morning, and Renetta Holtz with us today talking about fragrance in the garden. And Renetta, you were just talking to us a lot about the history, the perfumes, and how from ancient times people used plants and because of the emotional feelings that we attach with it. Yes. So fragrance really is pretty complex. It is complex. Um, what we're going to start talking about now is uh, we're going to go back a little bit more history. And um, we're actually going to talk about you know a strange topic when we're talking about beautiful plants and flowers. We're going to talk about the plague. Great. Well, and I'll let people get a good look at this image. Yes, look at those poor pocked up people. What a mess. Well, you know, the plague came into being, and um, the doctors and the, and the 
religious people felt that in order to get rid of the plague, they had to do something with the air because they felt that it was bad air that caused this. So they felt that herbs, anything fresh or clean or antiseptic smelling would help get rid of the germs. Well, they really didn't even know about germs, but the plague. So, I mean, it was a nice thought. And uh, in the next picture, you can see to what extreme they even went. This is a strange contraption, David. Have you ever seen anything like that? No, but it looks fashionable. I'd like to get one. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think it would be really comfortable either. This is actually a plague mask. Uh, back in the day, the doctors that were sent to take care of the, the patients with the plague, unfortunately, they were also kind of the subgrade doctors were given this mask to protect them from the bad air and this beak like protuberance yeah. at the end they would stuff with herbs in an attempt to protect themselves from the plague i was going to try to figure out how you're connecting the plague to fragrance and gardening so see well, it, it does all fit it does all fit together so don't forget that uh, herbs in the next shot that we have are really a great addition to your fragrance gardening besides um using it for culinary uses. I mean, it's not really gonna get rid of the plague or anything, but maybe a little mint in your julep would make you feel better. Right, but even as you're talking about culinary purposes, they say that even when you're eating food, that the scent, the fragrance of the food can account for like 50% of how we perceive the taste. That's right, so the, the sense of smell is very important. Um, when Marco Polo went and started in going around and, and looking at different places, he would come back with these wonderful, exotic fragrances and scents that really set the world on fire. But I have to tell you, we don't have to travel very far to find some plants that have a wonderful fragrance that are nice natives that we'd like to talk about. Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, so plants, I guess they're forming this scent or fragrance. Mm -hmm. We've talked about it in terms of you know how we love the just the, the comfortable feelings it brings with perfumes they were using for health benefits mm -hmm. but you know culinary purposes but surely plants aren't doing this for our well-being no they're not we benefit from it but uh, plants produce flowers for pollination flowers produce fragrance to attract the pollinators and it's very interesting because plants that are pollinated during the day are typically pollinated by butterflies, bees, and flies. And these plants have a very sweet fragrance. Conversely, plants that are looking for nighttime pollinators, such as bats or moths, have a much more musky, earthy, or spicy fragrance. Right, and so of course, one of the things we've talked about several times, and this is what we're talking about today, is a lot of times we wanna use native plants mm -hmm. to support our native population of pollinators. And of course, the fringe tree is just one of my favorites to for doing this. It's a great small stature tree, uh, sometimes overlooked because um, although it produces this beautiful showy bloom in the spring, after that it is a very nice tree, but you probably wouldn't notice it much at the garden center if it was not in bloom. But it's a great addition to your garden. It doesn't outgrow its bounds, and um, besides giving you a nice fragrance, it's very moisture tolerant. Right, so these are probably blooming in late April, May time period. Yes, yeah. yeah. So you won't see them in bloom, but like say, come on in the garden center and get one. There's a great addition. That's right. Uh, so let's, what's next? Let's next, we have uh, Carolina allspice, or what we call sweet shrub. This is an interesting plant, blooms in the spring. And um, some people say that the fragrance of the flower is sort of like a, a uh, berry, kind of a syrupy, maybe even a wine-like fragrance. Yeah, and for me personally, just you know, my own personal story, this is just a very special plant because when I was a child and just getting interested in gardening, visiting family in Missouri, they had this sweet shrub. I fell in love with the fragrance. For some reason, the color of that flower and the fragrance and my love of root beer at the time all connected. <laughs> well, there you go. And to me, it smells like root beer. And I actually, the, the lady I was visiting, and this is back when I was 10. I took a cutting of this, transported it all the way back to Virginia to root it and start one of my plants, one of my very first garden plants. So again, it's just neat how the fragrance and the memories will and transport it all you together. right back. Absolutely. All right. In the next picture, um, we're going to look at another my one of my favorite natives, a witch hazel, which blooms February March time frame with a fragrant blossom, uh, kind of a tall shrub, small tree, a great addition, deer proof, gives you that nice pop of color in the early spring.
Exactly. Now I have one of those in my front yard for all the above reasons. Well, there you go. Uh, we're going to move on to a plant, Virginia Sweet Spire. It is uh, moisture tolerant. It can grow in shade. A nice fragrance in the spring. And if we move to the next slide, you'll see that it also provides us a beautiful fall color. People love the burning bushes, but sometimes they can get big and out of control. Why don't you go with the native like Virginia Sweet Spire that gives you that red fall color? Exactly. It tolerates the dense clay soils and poor moisture conditions mm -hmm. that we run into. And we've got a couple others and we're running out of time. So I'm going to get out of the way and let you just okay, take these. Okay, we've got a couple, couple more. Uh, the next one is a beautiful bottle brush type flower. Um, I think we went backwards. There you go. Um, it's called Clethra or Sweet Pepper Bush. It's a Pied Piper plant, I call it, because when people come into the garden center, their nose leads them right to the Sweet Pepper Bush and they typically go home with one. And then we'll end this segment talking about a Sweet Bay Magnolia, which which again is one of my favorites. It blooms more profusely than the Southern Magnolia. Uh, it also has a sweeter fragrance cross between a Magnolia and a Rose, a great addition to your fragrance garden. So we're going to continue on and after the break we're going to uh, talk a little bit more about some history, science, and flowers. Hi, welcome back. We're going to cruise into the Renaissance now. And here I'm posing with Queen Elizabeth, who will pose with a rose here. Queen Elizabeth had a very sensitive nose. And uh, she, she had an issue that, uh, well, hygiene, let's say, wasn't at its finest during the Renaissance. So Queen Elizabeth uh, had said that every public place in her kingdom would be scented. So I'm sure that kept all the chemists busy trying to figure out where she was going to be to make sure that there was a wonderful fragrance awaiting her instead of uh, the more earthy fragrance of uh, poor hygiene. And uh, also in the Renaissance, it was very, very interesting as we look at the next picture, um, the very well-to-do ladies had their own chemists. They even would go so far as to provide an apartment for them, and that apartment would have secret passageways where their chemist would cook up a, a, some kind of a batch of scent, and they would go through these locked passageways to deliver the scent to the lady to make sure that they weren't apprehended on the way and the secret formula stolen. Well, the perfumers were also called glovers, and again, due to the lack of hygiene, the fine ladies would wear these gloves that were scented with perfume. And uh, if you think that it's new that celebrities have their signature fragrances, well, that's just a repeat from history gone by because these ladies had their signature scents. And when we move to the next picture, we're going to talk about one of the ladies that was very prominent. This is Queen Elizabeth de' Medici. And she took great pride in the fact that she constantly would be the forerunner with the wonderful fragrances. but. She did have a little bit of an ego issue and she really was not comfortable with the competition and the young up and comers who could unseat her. So you'd have to beware because the worst gift ever would be a gift from Queen Catherine. A pair of her beautifully scented gloves and her signature fragrance laced with poison. So you had to watch out. And uh, it's very interesting, like I said, fragrance is very personal and it's been going on for a long time. What I'd like to do now is talk to you. David's going to join me here at the Chrome screen, and we're going to talk about some surprising plants, some plants with fragrance that you may not know about. Well, uh, Queen Catherine, she's quite a competitor. She was. She's a tough cookie. Yeah, yeah. So Our business, we're more into friendly competition. We are. We are. So we're going to bring to your attention some plants that you might not think about having a fragrance. The first one is winter hazel. What do you think about this one, David? Well, it's a plant that... Uh, I, quite honestly, I see it at the garden center. Mm -hmm. I don't really see it used in landscapes that much. Not enough. And I think that's because it, it flowers. This is in very early spring, mm -hmm. actually late winter time period. And so that's when it's really eye-catching and most of us are spending our time indoors. Right. But if you saw this and smelled it, you'd want to have it. Yes, it has an upright, open habit. Um, nice bell-shaped flowers hanging down and um, again, kind of a sleeper on the lot when you see it when not in bloom. But uh, make sure you write down the name, Winter, ha Winter Hazel, so that you can add that to your shopping list for your fragrance garden. And it's nice 
nice. We always want interest at all seasons of the garden, and it does occur to me some of these, like the winter hazel, the witch, witch hazel, hazel, Edgeworthia, some of these right. we talk about, you know, that will add a little interest and fragrance, you know, in that late winter time period when it's a real blessing to have That's that. That's right, and that helps with the four season interest too. So now we're going to move on to our next fragrant plant, which is a mock orange. A lot of us love the smell of orange blossoms, but again, that's a tropical plant. That's not something that you can keep out outdoors year round. So you might want to think about adding a mock orange to your landscape. And this is what I call an old fashioned plant. They yes. used to be very, very popular. And then I think because they, they get kind of big and mm -hmm. a little bit uh, unkept looking, maybe they fell out of favor. But now, again, this is a plant that's almost been reintroduced, and there's so back. many varieties that are out there now. I can't remember, but I saw an interesting new one with huge blossoms on it. Yep. They came in, then they all sold. You then know, they all sold. <laughs> exactly. So, but, and again, we're getting new shipments every day, so come in so you can get some of these wonderful plants. Yeah. So I think it definitely has a place in today's landscape. It does, an old-fashioned plant brought back. And then we're going to move on to our next fragrant plant, which is, boy, this gets a lot of requests. This is winter Daphne, also a plant that will bring some fragrance to the garden during the winter. It's evergreen, and uh, several varieties do have a little variegated leaf with a white margin at the edge, making a, an unusual looking plant. And this, I, I don't even think there are words to describe the scent of the winter Daphne. Oh, it's absolutely fabulous. It's to die for. Now, I would say, again, yeah, to me, this is a little bit what I call a temperamental plant in the landscape. I mean, it's got to have sort of just the right drainage mm -hmm. conditions and exposure. But if you get in the right place, it's going to just reward you for years and years to come. That's right. And I have seen them thrive in full neglect as well. So maybe that's yeah. the key to, uh, to a happy Daphne is to ignore it. Yeah, but it's amazing how many, like I said, with all these different trees and shrubs we've been looking at that add that added benefit of fragrance. That's right. And so this is a nice evergreen one that does give you fragrance. Um, we're going to move on to some plants now that you wouldn't even think about having a fragrance. This is um, false holly or Goshiki osmanthus. Um, it is one of my favorite go-to plants for a lot of reasons. Um, it uh, will leaf out this bronzy foliage that you see and then it will be variegated and it's also evergreen it can take deep shade the deer will never touch it and it blooms a flower in the fall that you will you won't see but again you'll be walking through your garden and wonder what in the world is that wonderful sweet fragrance and it's the osmanthus bloom which is underneath the leaves you have to kind of look under there and yeah. it's a teeny tiny flower but a wonderful sweet fragrance of course I love this because I, I always say I'm the plant doctor or kind of thing. I'm looking at all the sick plants is great when the designer and the doctor come to agreement. I love this plant because it is one of my tough, durable, almost indestructible go-to right. plants. You so, need an osmanthus. So it's great when we can both fall in love with the same plant. Right. A couple more surprise plants. Uh, the next one here is um, something called um, Iliagnus. It's a plant that can be a screening plant, a Russian olive is another name, kind of a, an awkward plant at times, but I'll tell you, every plant has its good points and the good point in this one is that fragrance of Iliagnus. Again, a, a, a plant that we can't keep in stock when it's blooming, it's wonderful. Right, we sell a variety of Fruitlandii, which is specifically selected mm -hmm. for its fragrance. That's right. Uh, a couple more. Um, the next one we have is Sweetbox or Sarcococa. I guess this is the last one we're going to talk about in this section. It's what I would call a shrublet. It's a combination ground cover, shrub, blooms early spring with a teeny tiny flower. If you look carefully, you can see it, but the fragrance is kind of reminiscent of, of gardenias, I would say. I like the word shrublet. I've never heard that. I might, I might borrow that from you. I sometime. made that up. And the deer don't eat it either, so it's a great plant, evergreen, yeah. great addition to your shade garden. Another one we're going to agree on because of its durability as well. I can't believe it. we've agreed on two plants wow. in one show. This is fantastic. Well, we're going to take a commercial break, uh, but please stay with us. We're going to come back and share a little more history, plants, gardening, kind of a whole mix of stuff today. Okay, Renata, you've been sharing a lot with us about the history of fragrance, uh, yep. the uses and so on through there. Let's continue. All right, a little bit more history lesson. Um, the first 
person that we're going to introduce to you today in this section is King Louis the 15th and his court was called the fragranced court because again like so many of the kings and queens he adored fragrance and every room in the palace had to be scented every day with a different scent every day now you know that that kept his chemists hopping so uh, he he really loved his fragrance and then um, then we talk about a couple that I don't think really needs an introduction. You know those two? Well, of course, that'd be Napoleon and Josephine. That's right. And uh, they love their fragrance as well. Now, Josephine, she was um, a little avant-garde. She preferred musk to the floral scents, and uh, she used it very liberally. And it's said that 60 years after her death, her boudoir still smelled like musk. So uh, she, she must have really poured it on. And Napoleon as well, but instead of uh, the fragrance that she liked, he was more of a floral fragrance lover. And it is said that Napoleon would order up 40 bottles of lilac water and six quarts of jasmine per week. Double extract. Pretty uh, heavy consumer there. Yeah, pretty okay. heavy consumer. I just don't even know how you'd use that much. Yeah, I'm thinking go in just any grocery store now and you have all the room fragrances and scents and everything. He'd probably love today. I know. He'd go berserk. Um, so we're going to talk a little now about some of the fragrances or some of the plants that have a little bit more heady, strong fragrance. This is a jasmine, um, just like Napoleon liked. And they are not hardy here. But I have to tell you that um, I've purchased jasmine before and I take them out in the summer and keep Keep them on my deck and they're a wonderful addition to uh, my deck plants in the summer and the monarch butterflies absolutely love them yeah i mean i absolutely love that fragrance as well and it makes me think it's kind of interesting tying back to what you're saying earlier i think how we associate these fragrances with so many memories and we have people from all different parts of the world here and so i have a lot of customers coming in uh, I guess from, from their native land where the air would just be perfumed with jasmine and they, they want this fragrance, it reminds them of home. And so we, we have so many people looking for these fragrances. That's right. And uh, another real popular one uh, is a, are the Asiatic lilies, um, which uh, have just, uh, most of them are just finished blooming, but there's a few still out there like stargazers. And that's just a wonderful addition. I love putting them with a low ground cover and watching them rise up and, and pop open with that wonderful fragrance in the middle of the summer. You just can't beat it. Yeah, and I know when I'm selecting plants in my own garden, mm -hmm. you know, I am looking at from a design perspective, the color, the flowers, the bloom season, the structure, and I'm looking at all that. But when I go into selecting individual varieties, I'm always going to go for the one that offers the fragrance as well. That's right. That's, it's, it's very yeah. important. So this next one's kind of a good example of that. The next one's a great example. Um, a lot of people don't realize that now we have gardenias that are hardy here in Virginia. Not, um, not just the hothouse ones that, that you have to bring in every year, but we have, gosh, I think there must be five or six different varieties of hardy gardenia that grow from maybe um, three by three up to about six feet, maybe even more. They like full sun, and even though some of them have a single blossom that are a little bit different from the typical gardenia that we're, the tropical gardenia we're accustomed to, um, it, they all have the same wonderful fragrance. And this is my memory plant. Uh, whenever I smell it, I'm transported back to St. Cecilia's School, where all the girls wore gardenias in their hair during the May procession. So yeah, I've got one of these in my front yard again, and this year it's really taken off. Now I have to say it took about a, the first year it kind of struggled along, but this year it is just thriving. So yep. again, I think it needs to be a little sheltered, a little protected area. It's kind of marginal, but this is a great, it's a low evergreen shrub, so the foliage is beautiful. Flowering, you know, in late spring, summer, and fragrant, you know, it has a whole lot to offer. Once they get a foothold, they, they I find that they do quite well. Um, we're going to move on to the next plant, which is something that I, I couldn't believe it when I saw it at the garden center the first time. I thought it was like a, some kind of an alien plant, and then I looked at the Latin name, which is Edgeworthy, and I was certain somebody had made that up. Um, 
but the common name is paper bush plant. Very, very unique bloom, uh, an upright shrub, and these blossoms hang down. Um, their little heads nod down, and they they look like a tassel, I guess. And then at the last minute, they open up with these little trumpet-shaped blossoms that are very, very sweetly scented. It's a, quite a surprising plant, really a, a delight to have. Yeah, real specimen plant, I would say. Uh, the next plant is also um, what I would say the closest to a jasmine that you can grow here that's hardy. This is a sweet autumn clematis, and I love them. They bloom uh, August, September, maybe into October. Uh, it's a nice vine that I would say is pr pretty assertive, um, easily pruned back, but uh, it's a great, great plant to add some scent to your garden. And then a few other little unusual ones to think about. Akebia, which is an, also a nice vine, and this smells like chocolate. So if you're not really into the, the you know, floral fragrances, add a chocolate vine to your yard. Um, and what goes along well with chocolate, other than uh, I think we need to go the other way in the slides, would be the um, heliotrope, which um, we will see in the next slide. The heliotrope actually smells like vanilla. So you've got your chocolate vine and your vanilla heliotrope, so you've got a kind of a ice cream cone going there. Um, and then I want to finish with the corkscrew vine, which if you can get your hands on one of these is the most fabulous scent you will ever encounter in your life. Great. Well, I tell you, that is a beautiful flower, unusual, and like I said, we, we've really hammered this point home, but, you know, adding that fragrance to your garden as well. Got to have it. Underappreciated. Got to have it. Great. Well, we're going to have to take a commercial break. When we return, we'd like love to hear from you. So if you want to call, share any of your ideas, favorite plants that you have for fragrance, or have any questions at all about your garden, please give us a call right now, 703-387-1046. back everybody we've been talking about fragrant plants to add to your garden uh, and like I say if you have any questions or suggestions or just want to say good morning give us a call 703-387-1046 well Renata while we're waiting for calls to come in you know we had talked about several trees and shrubs mm -hmm. but we didn't give a lot of attention to some of the perennials okay um, why don't we start with a tall garden flux you know you probably know this one's named David. Well, I didn't pick it just by random choice. No, okay. No, but it really is a sturdy variety. It is a sturdy variety. It's resistant to powdery mildew. It, uh, and again, I love these, a lot of plants that just come up on these stalks and then have this wonderful blossom on the top. I like to combine them as a designer with um, like a low ground cover. Imagine you've got a, a low chartreuse plant like this and then coming up out of the top of it is this garden phlox with a wonderful fragrance. It's just kind of a fun combination to put together. It is great. So that's, like I said, that summer phlox is just one that's a terrific suggestion. Well, we have our first caller on the line. Ava's calling this morning from Silver Spring. How are you doing this morning, Ava? Hi, thank you. Great. Well, how can we help you? Uh, I have a problem with, I have pear and apple tree. Yes. Thanks to the squirrel, instead of being on top, they're on the bottom, on the ground. Yes. All over. I was wondering if I could put them in the mulch pile or not. Uh, you're talking about the, the apples and pears that are falling to the ground? Yes. Putting those in the mulch pile? Uh, you can certainly do that. I mean, you, you're, when you say mulch pile, you're composting them? Yes. Correct. Yeah. You can put them in the compost. Now, I will tell you a little side thing is sometimes they do attract flies that come because of the, the fleshiness and the moisture that's in there. And the other is if you start putting food like that into your compost pile, then of course squirrels and other animals are attracted to it. So uh, they will compost down, they will break down, they will um, add nutrients to it, but then you may also attract some other visitors. Yeah. I don't know if you had any input on that. No, you know, I think okay. you're right. That was, that was my thought too, is that although they do compost, I would be um, a little cautious about attracting more 
uh, rodents. The squirrel is cute, but it is a rodent to my property with you know fruit like that that's rotting and putting off an uh, you know an odor and attracting them. Would lime help? Pardon me. Would lime? Lime? Putting lime, yeah, in it. I don't know. Uh, not really. Not really. Most of the time when you see people putting lime in there, that's to adjust the pH or, you know, you'll see people doing that in kennels and stuff, you know, for uh, where, the, you know, the fecal matter and stuff. But no, you'll, you, like I said, you can use them, but, you know, you may, as long as it's away from the house, so you have some of these other nuisance visitors. But good luck with that, uh, and appreciate you watching our show this morning. Uh, let's see, we've got our next caller in here. It's uh, Carlos calling in. With, and Carlos, uh, you have a question about Mandevilla. I did. Well, I have a comment and a question. I think to add to your to add yes, to your uh, list of vines, the um, Mandevilla is a beautiful vine uh, that grows well into October around my house, and just flowers and flowers and flowers, and it would complement those other vines that you just mentioned. The question that I have is about the knockout rose. I bought a number of them there at uh, Maryfield, as well as in Mandevilla, and I uh, got mites right away, and I took care of that. But now they're growing quite nicely, but squally. They're tall and, and squally. Can I cut them back? Can I cut them back into a little bush, and they'll continue to flower? Uh, the answer is yes, but I wouldn't be too aggressive on pruning them back. Okay. Not at not at this point. Um, it's it's typically better to prune them back a little bit when they're dormant. Um, but knockout oh. roses are very forgiving. They're probably the most forgiving rose on the market. And if you need to trim them back a little bit off of the walkway or whatever, you could certainly do that. But I wouldn't be very aggressive about pruning it back at this time. Okay. When do they go dormant? Oh, well, sometimes they'll bloom. Actually, I saw them blooming into December one year when it stayed warm. But I would say, um, what, David, December, January time frame? Yeah, I, you get some beautiful flowers in them right up through Thanksgiving. Right. But, yeah, as you start getting into December time period, that's kind right. of the end of the season for them. Great. Very right. good. Thank you. All, All right. right. Thanks. And good suggestion on that Mandevilla. They are beautiful. They're gorgeous. Great. Now we've got our next caller on the line here, um, Kathy. How are you doing this morning? I'm good. Good. And what do you want to talk about today? My poor day lilies. Your poor uh, day lilies. What's wrong with them? Yes. Um, they, I have gorgeous day lilies, and some of them bloom once. Is that common? Do they bloom once? Are there some that bloom once and some? I see them beautiful everywhere except right. my well, yard. <laughs> we, we brought day lilies in for we, our fragrant did, flower did. session, but we just didn't have time to show right. them because, again, there's some really wonderfully sweet varieties. There are. Um, now, the day lilies, well, there are all different kinds of varieties. There are um, what would be called ever blooming day lilies, which repeatedly bloom something like Stella d'Oro. And then there are repeat bloomers, which will give you more than one bloom during the season. And then there are some that only bloom once. But I think now um, what we're trying to do at Maryfield is try to keep more of the at least repeat bloomers on the lot. Because, as you know, for all of us, nothing blooms long enough to keep us happy. This is true. So. Yep. So I'm going to just put in my own two cents and say my favorite daylilies are still the older ones that just give you one single bloom because, you know, they come up and those flowers are so large and magnificent and everything, but it is a short, shorter season. Well, that's true. So I have them in off. front of Arborvitae, a row of them in front of Arborvitae, a t very tall Arborvitae. Wow, so sounds... they're very... Um, they're gorgeous when they're there, but then I'm back to green. Yeah, I'm thinking that sounds like a feast for any deer that's in the neighborhood. But, but you know, uh, I don't, yeah. I don't have, I don't know why. Across the street, the deer jump the fence and come in. Mine, they could walk in the side and they don't come. So, oh, uh, sh don't. And tell the reason them. I have these is because actually they were given to me by a friend. She never saw a flower because the deer ate them before they flowered. Oh, so good. I have hundreds that she had planted. That. Well, you're doing a good job, but don't let the deer know they're there. Once they find them, you're... No, I haven't told them. Okay, yeah, good, good. I shouldn't good. have said anything. They might have been watching this morning. <laughs> yes. Well, I All hope right. not. <laughs> well, thanks. And, and thanks try some call. of those uh, repeat Thank varieties. You. Yeah, we're going to have to take a break right now, but please stay with us because we've got more of your phone calls when we come back.
Welcome back, everybody, to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. This is the part of the show where we take your phone calls, and we're going to jump right back into that. And uh, Fran, thank you for holding. How can we help you today? Oh, good morning. Um, my light pink crepe myrtle only has one blossom on it, and the same thing happened two years ago. I've had the tree for four years, and I'm beginning to wonder that it's only going to bloom every other year. Oh, that's oh. got to be disappointing. I know. Well, you know, I don't think that... Um, you know, I don't think you've got a bum crepe myrtle or anything like that, but um, let me ask you, are you pruning it at all during the spring? Uh, well, it's only four years old, so uh, just last week we took off some lower branches, but other than that, no, we haven't done anything to it. Well, a uh, crepe myrtle blooms, it, it, it enjoys being pruned in the early spring. March is a great month to prune a crepe myrtle, and that will uh, flush out some new growth, which the flowers are born on the stalks of the new growth. So a lot of times when people are you know, if it's a brand new crepe myrtle, I'd say maybe it's just getting acclimated and accustomed to your environment. But if you've had it for four years, I would strongly recommend pruning it in March. Uh, don't wait too much after that because you could possibly be pruning off flowers. But in March, and see if that doesn't uh, foster more bloom for you next year. I think that would be the easiest course to take. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, good luck with that. And we're going to move on to our next caller, who is Ann, calling in from Springfield. And how are you doing today, Ann? Good morning. I'm doing fine. Thank you. Good. Well, good to hear from you. And how can we help you? Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one of them is about gladioli bulbs. This is the first mm -hmm. time I've ever planted them. I planted them in my garden and in my pot. Oh, and they nice. they all come up beautiful green and no gladioli flowers. Huh. Now, you're using fresh tubers, right? I mean, you just bought the uh, bulbs or the corms, Correct, I should say, yeah. this year? Yes, this year's spring, yes. And they're getting plenty of sunlight? Oh, yes, full sun. Hmm. Well, I would say... Do you say think they I might be late bloomers? Are there, are there well, such they, a thing? I would expect them to be flowering by now, by this time of year, and it's a very reliable plant. Uh, the only time I've ever seen that happen is if they're very small, undersized corms, you know, where they didn't, um, you know, they just aren't mature enough to develop. Uh, so if the plants are healthy and you're using good size, mature corms, the only other thing I can think of would be maybe using some of those bloom booster fertilizers, um, or are you already trying that? No, I haven't tried anything. I just put them in and didn't try anything. Yeah. Well, they don't really require any special care, so most of the time you can just pop them in the ground and they flower. It's that simple. But if they're not cooperating for you, then I'd try some of these Bloom Booster fertilizers like Jack's Classic or even miracle Grow or Schultz. You know, a lot of these different companies make things that are very high in phosphate. And I'd start on that right away, and maybe, maybe we can still get some flowers out before the summer's over. Okay, now am I supposed to? Am I supposed to lift them out for the um, winter and put them in my garage? Yes, they're not completely winter hardy around here. It's the kind of thing that if you leave it outside and we have a mild winter, they might carry over, but if we have a severe winter, they'll die. So the, so the safe thing is to lift them at the end of the season as we get in more of that November, December time period and store them in a garage or shed. Okay, I have another question. My irises and my... Um Daylilies never bloomed either this year. Oh my goodness! Wow. What a it's all are you must a be disappointing very sad. flower garden. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean to me that if they, are they in the same garden bed, same environment? They are. They're all in the same. Well, one of the uh, gladioli are, you know, at the very end of my garden. I have a half acre, and so they're well separated. One one pot of gladioli, but everything else. The, uh, the irises and the daylilies are all in the upper yeah. garden under my front Yeah, I might floor. go through that whole bed and just try to work some super phosphate into the soil and know, like at the end of the season when you're doing your garden cleanup or something, try to work some super phosphate into okay. that entire garden bed and see if that gets you better flowers next year. Okay, thank you. What was the, uh, the plant you mentioned that went underneath the um, summer phlox? Because that is beautiful in my garden right now. Oh, this, it's a, it's a sweet potato vine. Um, it is an annual, but uh, it really covers a lot of territory. And so if you buy it in early spring and you plant it, you're going to have it, oh gosh, probably through Thanksgiving, maybe even a little bit later. Does it get as tall as the flocks? 
No, it's it's a more viney. It's more of a ground cover type plant, or it's great used in a pot to trail down the side. But no, it's not going to get tall at all. No. Thank you so much. Okay. You're thank welcome. You, we like your program. Thank you. Uh, we well, appreciate thank you very that. Much. And I think we just have time for one more call in here. And Paul, thank you for your patience holding on. Um, how are you Hello. today? Hello. This is. Uh, thank you. This yes. is Paul. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First of all, this spring... Probably going to have time for one, so let's take okay, the most I planted important. a bed of drift roses, and uh, I expected a flush of blooms and lots of color, lots of blooms. They're blooming okay, but not the way I expected. Should I be deadheading the uh, spent flowers? In the, but I'm not sure where the new blossoms would pop out of, so I want to be careful not to trim too much. So what's your, been, I, I, your experience with the drift roses? Well, I, I don't think that, I don't find that they need to be deadheaded. The, uh, the knockouts drift and carpet roses typically don't. But being that, uh, if it's, is this the first year they've been planted? Yes, yes. Well, it could be something as simple as the fact that they're um, getting established and hopefully next year they'll have a lot better bloom. Do you think that a rose fertilizer or rose food would help? Well, we'd love to, we'd love to uh, answer, but we're about out of time. And so if you give us a call at the Garden Center, we'll be glad to follow up with you. Sorry to cut you off, Paul. Yeah, sorry, Xim, but they're, they're going to cut us off. So That's again, right. <laughs> appreciate uh, you being here today, it Renata. Was fun. It was appreciate fun. everybody watching. Peggy will be here next week. Uh, she's got a program on you. To help.